but it's also special because we have also colleagues from the UN network on the prevention of racism and protection of minorities today with us and also very distinguished speakers. So I think very, very interesting session is ahead of us. I will not take much of the time, but just to remind us all um, if you can please stay on mute if you are not speaking to maintain the quality connection and sound and please do use the chat uh, so that uh, uh, we get most of this session. We can exchange if you have some ideas, questions, of course, uh, we will be constantly monitoring the chat. So post it uh, there and uh, you can also share some examples from your experience or um, the operations where you are working now. So if we can uh, move to the next slide, here we see the proposed agenda. Um, we will hear from Bruno Donat, the Global Coordinator of Mine Action Area of Responsibility, who will give us the opening uh, to this webinar. And thanks again for joining us from, from your mission in Palestine, very much appreciated. We will then continue with a panel. Um, we have with us Claude Kahn, who is uh, working with OHCHR and also the chair of the UN Network on Prevention of Racism and Protection of Minorities, as well as Marie-Joseph Aisi uh, from the third committee. And finally, Madeleine Garlick, who is the head of protection policy and legal advice section in the Division of International Protection in UNHCR. So we will hear very complementary uh, perspectives and uh, um, I would say angles how we can uh, prevent and respond and consider uh, um, uh, issues related to racism in our work. And we will open up for questions and answers, of course, so get ready, uh, prepare your questions you may have for our distinguished guests. And we hope that at the end of this event, we will also have a set of concrete um, recommendations or suggested points to further explore going forward on this uh, key and very crucial topic. So let me stop here and give the floor to Bruno. Um, as I mentioned, Bruno is now on a mission, but uh, the connection seems to be very good. And if you can please open our event. Over to you, Bruno. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to have been chosen uh, uh, to open this uh, very, very important, I would say, event and on topic, how to tackle racism and related intolerance in the context of internal displacement. Um, as soon as I start, I'm saying I am not either the specialist on internal displacement and I'm not the specialist on racism or intolerance. However, I'm a fellow colleague and I've worked a bit on all of those matters. I am today accompanied by my colleague, uh, Rosanna Shita. If you can show your face, because I can't see anybody right now, and I'm hoping from time to time you'll let me know that my connection is still okay. They make sure I have the best uh, internet for the next 15 minutes. A uh, special thanks, of course, to Valerie and the Global uh, Protection Cluster on Human Rights Engagement Task Team uh, for, for inviting me. I'm not sure why, but, but I'm happy to be here. So I think. Um, I will start by applauding the initiative because this discussion on this topic is important to shed light, you know, to, to have some concrete steps that can be taken by uh, clusters around the world, be it on protection and, and other matters, to fight racism and perhaps to advocate or ensure non discrimination for all internally displaced persons. Uh, I, I really hope, uh, based on what I heard before, the, that this web, webinar will raise further awareness and could be replicated down the road uh, with relevant uh, stakeholders. Um, in terms of introducing the topic, uh, some of you 
may have heard me before or not. Um, as um, I was introduced, I'm the global coordinator within the Mine Action AOR of the GPC. Uh, introducing the topic for me is uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. We should, if, if it's not too blunt, avoid being too ambiguous or naive or beat around the bush. That's how I introduce the topic. Now let me do the official quote as stated by my boss, some of you are, it's your boss, uh, current Secretary General, he says racism is a deeply rooted global evil. I'm quoting him, which perpetuates inequality, oppression and marginalization. So we see racism in many places especially of those coming from certain regions and we see the injustices so i set the scene so in the context from what i know i've done a little bit of homework in the context of internal displacement sometimes it can be racism xenophobia various forms of intersecting forms of discrimination that cause people to flee each other from their homes and, and are forced uh, to be IDPs. And I'm not using force in a, in a, in a, in a, in a I'm using it in a careful manner. Um, you know, in some places, racial discrimination is one of the main causes of internal displacement. And then folks are forced to leave their homes and preventing sometimes their right to return. And then we can expand the conversation whether it is internal displacements or qualify if you cross the border as a refugee, that's another conversation. In some cases, UN national staff are prohibited the same rights of international staff. And you would have followed the news, sometimes humanitarian aid is not permitted to, to enter in certain places. And oftentimes uh, IDPs are stereotyped in national and often international media that even affects their basic human rights. Now that being said, over the last months, years or year, there has been some progress in addressing racial discrimination, especially thanks, unfortunately, to what had happened uh, in the US with George Floyd. Uh, of course, when we look at data that is available, I don't know the specifics of all the data on internal displacement. We know there's a long way to go. So I think your webinar is so timely because we need to ride on this wave. Now, perhaps I was invited because they know that I'm one of those little champions of equality, diversity, and inclusion. And I think given we are speaking about it, one place to start prior to going into our specialty zone would be to look at our workplace culture. So we are aware, I hope you're aware, there's been some difficult conversations about racial equality or equity. And we are, I myself together with Rosanna opened it to some public fora to talk about racial equity I think it's called in the United Nations and beyond. Now, I have to tell you, this is not an easy ride. We even have in the workplace culture, our own colleagues challenging what we are asking about. Um, I'm not a specialist, but some folks would come back and say, no, 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 there's no racism because we're one big human race, one family. 
Another challenge I get in terms of workplace culture is, uh, oh, oh, it's not racism because it's nationality, the UN, we measure nationality. But almost, thank God, when we raised it, the official, internal at least, UN definition was racism includes pr pr prejudice, voluntary or involuntary, I don't know the exact quote, maybe uh, Rosanna can throw that quote, I'm, I'm ad-libbing right now, if it's not obvious, uh, in how the UN ombudsman went in the context of workplace culture to define how we talk about racism, which includes nationality. So racial discrimination and unconscious bias, I like to put a little bracket, unconscious and conscious bias can also affect our work in supporting the affected populations. So as all of us, I, I'm, I'm assuming here are professionals who are working in the humanitarian sector, sometimes we need to dig a bit deeper to have these type of conversations that you're having in this webinar uh, and to look into where are some vulnerable points, to look at some in inequities, inequalities, including race and nationalities that affect us all, because that's our place of work, our culture that, it, that we bring to what we need to do. So at least, I'm assuming most of you know, from the shop I'm in, in the United Nations, uh, you know the Secretary General recognized that the, we are not uh, immune from the scourge of racism, and he has is, is a, a task force on addressing racism and promoting, it's called Dignity for All in the UN, that should soon uh, release it was meant to be September, but the strategic action plan with some specific recommendations. Again, we are a huge body and it's like a huge ship, difficult to move. When we were discussing, as I share with you, as you, you dig in your own topic, I, one little area would be, it is so important when you go through your discussions, sometimes to do recording collecting and analyzing both qualitative and quantitative data, as this will help you raise awareness, whether it is through dialogues, engage, and whether you will start to draft some guidelines on equality, diversity, and racial inclusion. Um, I applaud your initiative again, because it is so timely and to address racism in your area as well as beyond, I think in line with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. I will not talk too much about what we do, but perhaps I will give you writing on an example of, of colleagues, a positive example, where our colleagues in Colombia, where they explain to us that internal displacement has disproportionately impacted indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. So they've had that as data, they've studied it, they've analyzed it, and when they have done protection, and humanitarian interventions, those same groups have been prioritized. So I think it's a good way to identify, have the difficult conversation, acknowledge and, and, and take action. So while I don't have amazing, uh, super wise words to tell you, um, with or without discrimination, the IDP as a person suffers already a lot. You, that is why I'm always praising you, Valerian team, 
should do everything possible to alleviate their suffering and not to, to remove that extra layer of harm. That's where I think we know this is being repeated to us at Ethereum. Try to get this do no harm approach so that when you implement your activities or initiative, you are able to really gear the future. Mm, again, if there were a key message to leave you as I conclude these opening remarks, I ask you as fellow human beings to not be on the ambiguity language or the naivete. Advocate for what you believe in and carry on that torch to shed some light for the future. And oftentimes it starts with little discussions and webinars and then later the network. Voila, I conclude my remarks and I really wish you a very good and productive session. I will not be able to stay. I need to go back to the mission, but I thought I would take a few minutes from Gaza and other places, but now, now I'm in literally in Gaza and Palestine. And thank you very much. And Rosanna will stay and Rosanna will, will somehow represent me in case there are questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Bruno. And I see some applause coming your way uh, in case you cannot see it. And for transmitting us this very, very powerful uh, um, words and very honest, very frank and also highlighting the link that if we want to better serve displaced persons, first we need to look inwards and it's all interconnected and uh, plays together. So I believe you have really set uh, our conversation very well for today. It's just a beginning for us. It's our first discussion on the topic. I'm sure it's not the last one. We will need to have many of those and different initiatives to follow eventually, but Thank you again for uh, all what you do in this area and for being available today during your field mission as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Very good, excellent colleagues. And this leads us actually to start uh, with our panel. And uh, we have Claude Kahn online uh, to get us started. Um, so without any delay, over to you, Claude. Hi, and thanks for having me. I'm outside and I very much hope the background noise isn't a problem. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, super. Um, so uh, with the limited time, I thought I would just try to do two things um, to be useful. Um, the first one is just to talk a little bit about the network, uh, the UN network uh, against racial discrimination and, uh, and on protection of minorities. Um, and then just to talk about one work from the field uh, that I was involved in. And I see we have Marie-Joseph online. It's a, it resulted in a third complaint. Uh, so it's a, hopefully a good segue to the secretary um, saying some words as well. Um, yeah, uh, the network was, uh, was founded in 2012 at the initiative of the previous Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Um, it was given a mandate that basically was to try to help UN agencies work together to address racial discrimination and protection of minorities. It was given a work plan uh, at that time that led up to around um, 2014. Uh, it did its work, I think, fairly diligently. And then following 2014, it became relatively dormant. Um, then Basically, in, in the events around George Floyd and the global outpouring of solidarity with Black Lives Matter in the United States and elsewhere uh, supporting other minorities, um, UN agencies far and wide began to realize that they were there was what was called a social ask um, coming from the wider public that we needed to do much more on racial discrimination and protection of minorities than we were doing um, 
uh, to date. And so since then, I think we've seen um, not all, but many UN agencies trying to think about seriously about both internally and externally how they will strengthen their work uh, to address racial discrimination and protection of minorities. Um, the largest, the sort of main work of our of the, of product of last year um, was an effort to provide guidance to UN teams in the field. And this is a, a document, really a 20 page document, um, which is five or six questions, set pages of questions around different themes that is intended to help UN teams in the field, country teams, humanitarian teams, um, groups such as yourself, um, ask and identify questions related to the situation of minorities and, uh, and the situation of racial discrimination um, where they are working with a view to developing better programming to address these issues. And Peter has just put the, the document on screen. Um, it begins with a short introduction. It has a, a first page that's basically for leadership um, to help the, you know, the heads of agencies and teams in the field um, think about the higher level. And then it has around five or six pages of questions for the technical level um, that are intended to help, again, um, basically following the thematic structure of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination um, to walk through what are different rights and different areas where UN programming might, might be strengthened um, to address racial discrimination. That's the page area, approximately six to 10. And then following that, um, there are sources and guidance around each of those areas. Um, the main background framework is the, the ICERD Convention, the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, um, as well as two kind of, uh, let's say, auxiliary sets of commitments. One is the 1992 UN Minorities Declaration, which sets out um, the rights of national, ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. And the second one being uh, the Durban Declaration on, and Plan of Action, which you know implements the commitments made at the World Conference Against Racism in 2001. So uh, I, I just mention that to you because I think it is also helpful for those of you uh, in this conversation who are thinking about how to strengthen our programming in these areas as concerns internally displaced people. Um, it's really meant to help, simply to help UN staff uh, walk through the facts that are in front of them and think seriously about the, the law and the legal underpinnings um, that can strengthen the policy work. It doesn't have any, um, you know, miraculous answers. Um, it's it's basically to help you have a tool that you can look in detail at the different areas that may be facing uh, a complex community and a complex problem, um, such as internal displacement. And, and think seriously about addressing uh, racial discrimination issues in them. Um, I guess the Valerie and Peter can make available the document and, and um, we're very happy to provide additional resources if you would like to have them. We also welcome anyone who wants to join the network. Um, there are around 200 UN staff now in the network. Um, and if you would like to be one of those, you would be receiving emails on average around once a week. Um, and please let Valerie know she'll send them on and we'll, we'll include you in the list. That's one thing. Uh, I, and then I wanted to just really use, do I have two more minutes, three more minutes? Is that okay? Um, okay. I just thought I would uh, tell one uh, experience from the field on strengthening documentation of, of racial discrimination. We had a pre, um, pre webinar discussion um, and it was pointed out that really the, these issues related to internal displacement frequently involve, you know, what you might call sort of intimate, intimate strangers in, 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 in a particular context. They're not refugees coming from faraway countries in need, need of um, support in adjusting to life in a new place. They're more likely people who are known um, to the majority communities and may face, you know, the kinds of uh, stigma 
discrimination and negative sentiments that may already be embedded in, in a society and may in fact be a component of the kinds of forces that have caused their displacement in the first place. Um, you may want to have a look at a complaint brought to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination by someone called Grigori Zapescu. It's a case concerning the Republic of Moldova. Um, and it was done using uh, the methodology called testing to prove racial, to prove discrimination. Testing is a, a, a mode of proceeding that has been developed by civil society organizations and the UN and courts um, and litigators worldwide to document uh, discrimination um, with, you know, the different treatment that is frequently very evident and present in front of people and yet very hard to prove because denied wherever it is uh, existing. What testing basically does is um, a tester, uh, a testing exercise, sends two identically or sim very similarly situated pairs of testers in to document differences of treatment. So this could be into a job application process or for flat rental or into a hospital context or into schooling. Um, it's harder to do in schooling. It's easier to do in, in job, job search and, and uh, housing, housing availability um, scenarios. It's been done with things as basic as taxi services. Um, it can be used in restaurants and bars. And uh, the idea is you send in one control group, someone from the majority community, um, usually a pair of people from the majority community, and then uh, two similarly dressed, similarly aged people from the group that you're testing. In this case, from let's say an ethnic group that is living in uh, 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 internal displacement. And then um, the documentation becomes, how are they treated? Um, what, what are the differences and similarities in what happens when they, uh, when they apply? Um, in the Zapescu case, uh, he was a Romani man from Moldova who applied for a job at a fast food restaurant. And he listed in his job application that he spoke Romani. He didn't list his ethnicity, but he, he said that he spoke, that was one of his, his languages. Um, and he was not called back for an interview. He was, uh, asked only a series of very cursory questions. Um, and he was basically not then not given the job. Um, and a very similar person uh, from the Mold Moldovan majority, who, you know, who was his age and, and very similar to him, was called back for a detailed interview. And, and, uh, and the treatment, which they were able to record by, by listing all of this evidence, um, constituted what ultimately became a complaint to the, the, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, I just mentioned this because you can structure programming around this. Um, if you're struggling to find data um, to, to gather evidence or gather materials which, which show patterns of discrimination in a society, these are among the techniques that can be used in order to do documentation work of these forces. And um, in the context that we've frequently find ourselves where people say, you know, there's no data, there's no information, there's no, we, we don't have the material to show um, that these things, that there are these different patterns and practices of discrimination. Testing is a very uh, useful methodology for that. I will stop there. Um, any questions are welcome. Uh, I'm sitting outside, so I can't post my email address into the, into the chat chain, but, um, Valérie certainly is welcome to, uh, we welcome direct questions or ones sent through uh, Peter and Valérie. And uh, yeah, over. Thanks so much, Claude. And I'm sure there will be uh, definitely questions coming your way uh, in a few moments as well. Um, I believe the checklist you uh, you presented and Peter put it also in the chat is a very useful tool. It has been developed by UN agencies, but we have also a lot of colleagues from NGOs on the call. I just want to draw the attention to this tool because I believe uh, that it's valid and can be adjusted, contextualized, basically to any context in which we work. 
and it can be as a reference tool to check where are we, what should we be doing, are we taking uh, those aspects enough into consideration in our planning, in our monitoring, in our follow-up, evaluations, etc. So I would just like to attract attention to it. Um, Definitely, if you are interested to know more about the network, we, we will channel also the information to Claude. It's a very dynamic uh, uh, platform. And thanks also, Claude, for uh, providing us with a very concrete example from the field, uh, how you have demonstrated uh, cases of uh, racial discrimination. It's also very useful. And you created a very nice bridge with our next speaker, uh, who is Marie Joseph from the CERT committee. And I will give you now the floor, Marie Joseph, uh, to take us forward on this topic. Over to you. I think you are on mute. Yes, do you hear me now? Super. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Valeria, I'm very grateful for inviting me to join this webinar, uh, which I really find very important, uh, you know, as I think that the discrimination against uh, IDPs is uh, sometimes a little bit overshadowed by, by discrimination against uh, other, uh, other categories. Um, I also want to greet all colleagues who made themselves available to, uh, to attend uh, this webinar. Um, my intervention has two parts. So the first one, I will, I will speak a little bit very quickly about the third, and and then I will move on the uh, to talk on the uh, the third and, and and the protection of the of the IDPs. Uh, so I, I will just say a few words on third because I'm not sure that everyone is familiar with with that committee. Uh, so the third committee uh, has been created by the Con International Convention Against All Forms of Racial Discrimination that I invite all of you, you know, to, to look at and, and to use as, as a tool uh, for advocacy. Uh, and its mandate is, uh, main mandate is to ensure the monitoring of state compliance with TD obligations through different procedures. Uh, and the first one, uh, which in my view is one of the most important uh, event uh, the most important I would say is the reporting procedure uh, according to which third party uh, submit uh, normally every two uh, every two uh, every two years according to the convention but this has been uh, extended a little bit extended a little bit by the committee uh, they submit to the committee a report on on the measures that they are taking in order to implement uh, the seven articles of the convention the main articles of the convention and the substantive article of the conventions. So this is really done uh, usually through dialogue uh, with the delegations that come to Geneva uh, and discuss with the committee on various issues that have been put to the to the committee. And, and among these issues, we the committee usually address the right of the protection, the right of the refugees, as well as the right of, of, of IDPs. Uh, and the result, the outcome of this dialogue is, is what we call the concluding observations, in particular the recommendations that are made by the committee to, uh, to the state party in order to guide the state party on how it should give effect to the different, uh, to the different provision of the, of the, of the convention. Uh, the second, I would say, activity on, on mandate of the committee is to examine the, the individual complaints uh that either individuals or group of individuals could uh, submit to the to the committee provided that the state party uh, in question has accepted uh the competence of the committee to deal with this kind of individual uh, individual communications and um so idps for example mdps that find that uh, their rights have been violated uh, could submit uh claims uh, before uh, before the committee, individual claims before the committee, uh, helped by that, for example, uh, by uh, non-governmental organizations. And uh, the third one, uh, perhaps I will skip it, the third one is normally uh, 
what we call interstate compliance with regard to the interpretation or, or the application of the convention. Uh, for now, the committee has, has uh, uh, only received three interstate communications. Uh, so it's not it's not a, a procedure that is often used by by, by states. And um, the fourth one is what we call the general recommendations. And I have tried to uh, to forward to you the general recommendation uh, 22 adopted by the committee in 1996 on uh, refugees and uh, and IDPs. Uh, the general recommendations are guiding tools that are adopted by the committee uh, um, in order to assist a state state uh, to firstly understand uh, the different provision of the committee, the content of the provision uh, of, of the, the committee, the scope and, and so on, and, and then help uh, this uh, state to, uh, to better implement the provision of the convention. As I said, the general recommendation uh, on refugee and NDPs was adopted by the committee in 1996. Uh, it is not, it is old, but it's not outdated. And uh, so I will come, I will come now to the, to the third and, and the protection of, of the IDPs, which is my second part. Firstly, I would like to say that uh, third considers uh, IDPs along with other categories of individuals such as migrants, uh, refugees, uh, minorities, people of African descent, indigenous people, as, um, as groups of, group of people who should, uh, which deserve a specific protection of the convention because of their vulnerability to racial discrimination and xenophobia. And, uh, and for that, the committee has, has adopted a number of general recommendations in, in order to lay out uh, the different rights that uh, these people, uh, the different rights that this, <coughs> these different categories uh, should be protected, should be protected under beyond the general protection that the committee, the, the convention offers to uh, to uh, to all of us. Uh, and this is really important uh, when we come to the IDPs, in particular, IDPs who. Uh, belong to ethnic or ethnic uh, religious minority or to the Roma minority. Uh, I have to say that all these categories that I have uh, have talked about are not uh, mentioned in the in the in the ISIL convention. So this is really the interpretation that the committee has has made uh, of the of the of the of the convention, which is. Learn out, learn out uh, throughout uh, the jurisprudence of the committee, in particular the jurisprudence stemming from uh, the work of the committee on uh, state state reports. Through 1993, the committee adopted the general recommendation, uh, which outlined the duty by state to prohibit and to eliminate racial discrimination in all forms, and to guarantee the right of everyone, of everyone without distinction uh, to equality before the law, uh, with regard to political civil, civil rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, this means that IDPs are entitled, uh, as everyone, uh, to all these rights, civil and political, but also economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, as they are usually, they usually live in the jurisdiction of the state party, and in particular because they are often nationals of state parties. So for those who are national of the state party, they are entitled, full, entitled fully uh, uh, to all these rights. And for those who are not, uh, this can happen, who are not national of the state party, of course, uh, they are not entitled to fully to all political, all political rights. Um, the general recommendation refers to the forced displacement of person on the basis of their ethnicity, of their ethnicity in the context of uh, of conflicts. So it means that normally in the this general recommendation put aside, I would say other form of uh, other form of IDPs. We are talking about IDPs, 
uh, about for this, this displacement that can be caused with develop, uh, by development project and so on. Uh, it means that normally this general recommendation does not address this kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, internal displacement. Um, the general recommendation, the general recommendation uh, outline, uh, I would say, three or four principles. Uh, the first one is <coughs> is the freely return, the free return of IDPs to to their home. So the state party should ensure that IDPs who would like to return to their home uh, that they can do it uh, under uh, uh, safe safe conditions. The state party also have the obligation to ensure that the return of displacement person is voluntary, is voluntary, and uh, and then IDPs after their return. Uh, to their home of origins, they have the right to be restored to their to their property that have been taken to them, or if this is not possible, to be uh, compensated. This is the, the famous that <clears throat> rest that you know restitution or or compensation. Um, and the fourth one is that displaced person have also after the their return to their homes of origin the right to participate fully and equally in public affairs at all levels and to have equal access to public services and to receive rehabilitation assistance. Um, so the committee has applied this in a number of concluding observations and recommendations. For example, in the recommendation made to Bosnia and Herzegovina, the committee has raised the issue of uh, returnee which were facing difficulties regarding their reintegration into the society. And they were also facing obstacles uh, in accessing the uh, in accessing the, the labor market and also social benefits, the committee did the same uh, in concluding observation regarding uh, Colombia. Uh, that was in particular uh, about the land restitution to uh, to IDPs, Colombian IDPs. Most of them were either uh, people of African descent or uh, indigenous people, and the committee did so uh, again with regard to the local reintegration of IDPs in Ukraine. But the committee is not limited to this. The committee has gone a little bit beyond this general recommendation in recommending state. Finally, firstly, in, in raising uh, concern and recommending state about issue of direct or indirect discrimination against IDPs in accessing uh, economic, social and cultural rights, such as employment, housing, uh, water and sanitation, adequate food, healthcare services, on equal footing with, with the others, and the committee also warned about the lack of inclusion of IDPs into their society, or the limit, the limited freedom of movement of IDPs in conflict and post-conflict situation. We have seen this. Um, we have seen this in Iraq uh, and also in Ukraine, where some IDPs were banned by local authorities uh, to access assess this uh, part of the territories. And the committee has reiterated uh, the fact that the state party should promote and protect the freedom of movement of uh, all IDPs in uh, all part of the territories. Another thing which is very important in the recommendation of the committee is the collection of data. The collection of data regarding the IDPs uh, for the committee are, are, are very important because uh, they, they permit the the not only the state party but also the committee to evaluate how uh, IDPs enjoy the rights as they are uh, protected under the covenant under the convention. Of course, this jurisprudence needs to be to be uh, extended, and I think that as the committee will continue to review state, the committee will make some progress. You know, in uh, in uh, in the jurisprudence regarding the protection of IDPs. Uh, the final thing uh, before I conclude that I, that I would like to say, perhaps actions that could be taken by all of us uh, in order to promote the protection, uh, firstly to promote the right of IDPs and also to uh, to try to protect the right of IDPs. The first one is really to promote the right of IDPs and advocate for them uh, before national authorities, to make them known to the population. Um, uh, to engage state and other stakeholders to promote also tolerance and understanding 
uh, among populations where racial discrimination is directed against IDPs, uh, to promote IDPs' rights among their, their own population, because IDPs should also uh, be aware of their own rights and how to defend their rights. How, what, uh, and, and, and uh, about the remedies that are available to them in case they are violated. At the international level, I think all of us, we have a lot of avenues, but we forgot to say, I think that we should use the existing mechanism in order to, to promote and to defend the rights, the right of NPs, uh, in particular in situations where they are really at stake. And, and for example, for search, you could use, or, or for other committees, you could use the reporting procedure, which means that you could bring uh, to the attention of the committee uh, the situation of IDPs, uh, where uh, it comes that a specific state party uh, is reviewed by the committee so that the committee could raise this issue during the dialogue with the third party, uh, with that state party, and, and make the recommendation. Uh, you could also use the third early warning and urgent action uh, procedure, which for in, for for uh, for uh, situation that require require immediate attention, so that the committee could trigger uh, his this procedure and make either a statement or engage in a dialogue with the state party. The final thing is that, of course, uh, I think that working in in a, a coordinating manner, coordinated efforts among different agencies. It is what also uh, we, are, we are doing, and, and Claude has talked a little bit about the, the racial discrimination net network uh, on the right of minorities and, and so on. I think this is a kind of initiative that are really important to together, you know, uh, bring our energies in order to promote and defend the right of of, uh, of IDPs. I will stop there, and of course, get familiar with the with the convention. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Joseph. It's always uh, so inspiring to hear such an overview and I learned so much uh, from from what you share with us today. And it always triggers me to reflect more how little usually us as humanitarian uh, actors, we use the human rights mechanisms and its potential and uh, the full scope. So I hope a call for all of us uh, to be more strategic in that regard. And thank you very much uh, for the overview you, you gave us. Uh, Peter was posting the different documents um, in the chat as you were speaking. So colleagues, you can access them there. Uh, and uh, um, now we were supposed to move to our last speaker, uh, Madeleine Garlick from UNHCR. Unfortunately, she just sent me a message. She's still caught in a meeting of UNHCR XCOM, the executive committee, which happens on annual basis negotiations with uh, all UN member states. So uh, she sends her excuses and she asked me to deliver at least key messages from uh, uh, from her um, speech. So with apologies, I'm now shifting my head. So I'm <laughs> moving to, to the UNHCR and very briefly just to uh, share um, that of course, reiterate what was already also said by uh, by Claude, by Marie Joseph, that the racial discrimination and related intolerance is not only a protection issue while in displacement, but oftentimes also really the driver why people leave uh, their homes and uh, um, uh, it can be a major driver of displacement in a different context, but it can on the other side also hamper the durable solutions. So prevent people uh, from coming um, back home as Marie Joseph was uh, just also outlining. UNHCR has issued a few months ago a guide on how to address uh, and prevent uh, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance. P Peter, please, if you could post the link in the chat. And uh, the guide is uh, the guide is uh, um, basically a recollection of good practices. So we hope that it would be useful 
um, uh, it could be useful for uh, different operations to get an inspiration. And thank you, Emmanuel, for pointing out that racism and intolerance is also root cause of statelessness. Definitely, uh, very good point, and it's also a part of the guide that Peter will be posting in the chat. But uh, here are some key points that you uh, that Madeline asked me to share with you. Um, that uh, for us as humanitarian actors, we have a long way to go still in terms of tackling in our programs, uh, uh, in our protection responses, uh, racism, racial discrimination and xenophobia. And it starts from having stronger monitoring and assessments of signs of racism and xenophobia, which may impact uh, internally displaced persons. So weave it into our participatory assessments, into our monitoring systems, uh, but not to only work on the monitoring, but also have in place mechanisms how to deal with cases that may be referred to us. And know what could be referral pathways, ensure that uh, response mechanisms are clear for identified cases, and also have a system of referral between different actors on the ground, including the state authorities as relevant per the context. So, what is the current situation is that in, of course, in all countries, unfortunately, there is uh, racial discrimination and uh, xenophobia related intolerance. So far in our humanitarian bubble, we have been uh, speaking more about social cohesion, intercommunal tension, but we should be also bold if it's racism to call it racism and take appropriate actions to um, uh, against it. So it also includes to work very closely with affected populations and Marie Joseph, you, uh, you articulated very well the importance of human rights education. We have on the call Elisa, who is really an expert in human rights education and how to empower internally displaced persons to be able to uh, to be an active um, actors actually in that regard, but also make a strong connection with host communities to promote social cohesion and work on the prevention side. We often also tend to work in silos, so uh, engaging with faith-based organizations, community leaders, of course NGOs, but such actors such as parliamentarians is key. We cannot tackle the issue alone and uh, would be unable, but be a bit more innovative in terms of who are our key actors with whom we um, collaborate on, on this. And uh, definitely reiterating the message uh, before uh, in regard to Marie Joseph presentation, human rights mechanisms can be a very useful tool uh, uh, in that regard, um, be it on the advocacy side, highlighting the key issues, amplifying our advocacy messages, addressing specific cases in a whole range of area, but we are not yet there in, in terms of using their full potential. So, uh, those are just very brief messages that I'm conveying to you on behalf of Madeline. Uh, apologies that uh, she she could not make it in the end. Um, and I see that Peter also posted uh, in the chat in response to Emmanuel's point um, an interesting uh, um, event which is happening on 21st of October uh, on equality and non-discrimination nationality matters to end statelessness co-organized with OHCHR. So you may be interested also in that. So let me finish here and conclude our, our panel and turn to you, dear colleagues. And I am aware that this is uh, maybe a new topic to many of us that we reflect on it in relation to our work um, and that it may be somehow sensitive as well, but we would be very happy to hear from you if you would like to take the floor directly. You are most welcome to do so. Elisa, thank you. 
and then Huda. Elisa, over to you. Thank you so much, Valerie, and thank you so much to the panelists. I do have a question. I will be interested to know if there is um, around this table people that have really worked um, on tackling racism and discrimination in the operation using human rights education. So this could be very interesting and useful for the task team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elisa. A clear call for examples uh, from the part uh, to the participants. Um, and over to you, Huda, please. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, this is Huda from UNHCR. Sorry, I cannot switch on my camera. I'm in Tunisia, so I'm trying to uh, have a good network while talking. So uh, my my question, um, as you know, I, I was in the field for years and I worked in different uh, operation where uh, IDPs were, were treated in um, with different uh, standards um, and we unfortunately always see bad and good IDPs when it comes to, to national authorities, those who are coming from area of origin that are more or less uh, with a uh, similar political affiliation or ethnic groups or uh, uh, religious background that the uh, governing uh, uh, authorities or uh, the, the, the authorities managing the, some sites or camps. Um, and uh, it's always very difficult for, for IDPs to uh, speak up and to, to be vocal about that, even if they share individually uh, some frustration with protection officers or partners, when it comes to um, to raising the issue more broadly or with the, with the human rights mechanism, it becomes uh, another uh, another issue for them and they don't want to, to go that far because they are afraid from retaliation and, um, and to be seen as um, part of the opposition or uh, any uh, other like reason uh, for which they don't want to raise that more broadly. So uh, my question would be uh, um, about the, the human rights mechanism and the use while we have this do no harm principle and this uh, fear of IDPs like clearly expressed during uh, individual interviews. How can we manage that uh, this frustration? And this is also part of the answer to uh, Elisa regarding human rights education. In some contexts, it's very difficult to uh, to conduct uh, or to to contact human rights uh, institution to to conduct any sessions or focus group discussion because it's a, it's a very challenging context and. Um, it's very difficult to raise that uh, either uh, in a camp or a settlement. Over to you. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Huda, and thank you for grounding us because with your very strong field experience, I think you bring clearly the dilemma uh, between when we see and identify the problems when IDPs come to us as protection officers and speak to us, and then the next step what can be actually done, how to support them in this very sensitive uh, environment. So I'm sure our uh, panelists will come back to uh, this. We have also Said from OHCHR, I believe on the call. Uh, so a lot of wealth um, of experiences. But before that, I would like to give the floor to Roberto. Over to you. Uh, hi, Valerie, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. So I think uh, what I want to ask is, as we, uh, as we, as a lot of society, people and society in uh, certain countries are more aware of racism, uh, it inevitably moves uh, in a more sub, uh, towards a more more subtle manner, uh, in which it of course tries to avoid uh, classic uh, signifiers of uh, racism, be it slurs or specific uh, specific classic examples of uh, hate crimes that are very much ob obvious. And I think this would be a, a question of if uh, a certain person comes forward to us and uh, with with regards to a certain incident, how would how would we help uh, try to uh, try to assist them uh, and also try to identify whether or not this is racism and whether or not uh, we can escalate this because with these uh, more more pervasive types of racism. If we try to 
escalate these types of issues. Sometimes it can uh, it can impact a lot of times uh, relations with the local uh, with the local society or government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Roberto. Also, very uh, concrete uh, uh, um, question: What actually can be done, and if there are any examples? So, I will turn back uh, to Claude first, uh, to Marie Joseph, but to anybody uh, uh, on the call as well. As I'm sure uh, you have various um, elements of response to uh, to, um, to put forward. Over to you, Claude. Um, these are great questions, and it's it's really wonderful to be a part of this discussion. Um, I mean, there are no simple answers to any of the questions raised, um, but maybe I'll just offer a couple of things. Um, I think uh, the second intervener, in in a sense, answered the first question. Um, in that in that um, you know, human rights education, I think, is very important. Um, but and and also, we need to be very mindful and clear um, of the actual situation of of um, of the people that we're supporting, um, meaning also, you know, it, it's um, it's hard to tell people about rights if 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 they're in you know if they're in very exposed uh, situations and and we're powerless to to provide any any uh, you know protection insight. So I think one does need to be um, clear, empathetic sympathetic and 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 um you know in 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 our work to provide support to victims of of discrimination and and other forms of human rights abuse um that said i also think it's important to be aware that some people do want justice um and they that's what they want to have happen um and so we shouldn't stand in the way of that either um in a previous life i was a litigator uh, and I think, you know, we used to apply the sort of one in 10 rule, which was, um, you know, the one in 10 people do want to go forward, also aware of the risks. Um, we need to also try to be there for those people as well. Um, that, you know, people need to understand clearly what the risks are and, um, you know, and, and the fact that, that there can be very serious repercussions of bringing a justice claim. But that um, if 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 they so desire, we should be there for that category of people. Um, yeah, um, that that means doing a lot of listening and doing a lot of uh, communicating and understanding where people are coming from and and who one has uh, in front of them. Um, that concerns the victims themselves. So in, in terms of using the mechanisms, you know, this is what we think about when we think about um, how can we help someone try to bring a justice claim. But I also, uh, I think it's important also to remember that um, you also have roles in, in using the mechanisms in the sense of um, the system wants to hear about what you are seeing and what you are experiencing and what the forces in front of you are. Um, there are plenty of places in the world where, uh, you know, there a lot of, not a lot of factual information is coming forward because, um, you know, the government doesn't want us to talk about it. The people are afraid. Um, there are any number of things interfering in in the system, gaining a, a deep understanding of what the forces are, and you are you are the you are the knowledge base for that. Um, UNHCR, for example, regularly briefs CERD. It does so confidentially, but it brings its understandings to the attention of the committee. Um, you, the, there are other ways in which you can share your understanding and information so that the, the system as a whole gains a better understanding. So I, I think we both need to be aware of what our particular roles and abilities and, and, and possibilities are as well as those that we exercise when we try to support the public at large and, 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 and our, 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 you know, constituencies and communities of, of, uh, uh, of people we serve. Over. Thank you so much, Claude. Um, and uh, over to you, Marie Jose. Yes, OK, thank you. Um, I think that I will, yes, complement uh, what Claude has, has just said in the 
the possibility to use the mechanism. Uh, I think that if in uh, in uh, in the country where you, you you work or the locality where you work, there is really no possibility, you know, to talk to authority to the authorities uh, or to raise the issues with the authorities because those who are complaining, IDPs who are complaining of racism, uh, could be uh, could fear uh, uh, reprisals. Uh, I think you could do two things. This is what the, the kind of the doctrine that the committee has uh, has said for for a number of years, because in in, in many in, in many cases, victim of racial discrimination either they don't know, they don't know their rights, or they could also fear uh, fear reprisals. Uh, so they do not complain. So the first thing could be when this has come, you know, kind of pattern, uh, you could collect, you know, could collect all, all the claims that you have you have received and realize that this is really a big issue that you could put forward, you know, uh, and discuss with the authorities. Uh, it's very, very important that the authorities facilitate uh, the possibility of, of uh, IDPs and other people who are victims of racism or racial discrimination to access uh, a remedy. This is really something which is, which is important and something that the committee has always highlighted in, in, in the recommendation. And, and, and for that, the committee always also asked the state party, you know, to educate police officers and so on and how to, to detect, you know, a racial discrimination issue when people come to, uh, to complain and to protect these people, you know, uh, against any form of of reprisal, and and uh, yes, and the second thing, as as Scott said, is is the possibility uh, to bring this this kind of situations uh, to human rights mechanism to treaty bodies or even to special procedures, because most of the special procedures have the police the possibility to receive and to address uh, and to address communications. Thank you so much, uh, Marie Joseph. Ah, very good. I'm wondering if uh, Said uh, or Rosanna, you would like to come in uh, to complement also some of the discussions. Yes, we don't have Bruno anymore online. Yes, thank you, Valerie. Uh, it's a really like an interesting discussion and uh, for all of us. And especially I was also reviewing all the uh, information that has been shared in the chat. I found them really useful. Um, just to complement, I think an important aspect uh, to take into account, as Boone also mentioned, is uh, on uh, racism and racial discrimination that often occurs also in our own workplace culture. And that can also affect our the world that we deliver in, uh, in the humanitarian sector. Uh, unfortunately, we, will, we sometimes have also unconscious bias and uh, it's important to recognize them that we may have some unconscious bias given also different cultures. Um, I know that the, the Secretary General has uh, has launched last year, uh, that, as Bruno also mentioned, the Task Force on Addressing Racism and Promoting Dignity for All. Uh, they often conduct also trainings on unconscious bias and on how to um, to address discrimination in our workplace culture. So I think that as humanitarian workers, it's important for us also to, to keep updated about all these activities. Um, I can also paste uh, some, some more information in the chat if, uh, if you are interested. Uh, but yes, this is an important aspect. Uh, for instance, here like the UNMAS Geneva office, uh, we have tried to promote it, um, uh, more trainings, more uh, raising awareness sessions. Uh, so one activity that we are um, that we are implementing is, for instance, a series of sessions on uh, racial equity in the workplace. We have uh, called an an expert senior facilitator uh, because, of course, like we are not expert on on the subject. We are just people who want to um, try to address them. But um, of course, we need some uh, some guidance. Uh, so this is one activities and uh, we are also organizing some uh, regional consultations in different languages with the with the larger mine action community in this case um, to also get feedbacks from our partners to consult as, as you are doing right today with uh, with your colleagues and uh, uh, with the mine action area of responsibility with um, other NGOs. 
um, because I think it's important to also um, get not only just do it in our own offices, but like partnership and cooperation is, is key when we need to tackle this uh, um, like a global scourge such as uh, such as racism. So yes, thank you again for for organizing this. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Rosanna, and also for reminding us the work we need to do, all of us, on those unconscious biases and making sure that uh, we minimize the impact on our work uh, and really um, we empower the persons of concern and we serve. So thank you. And I'm sure colleagues would be interested to read more. If you could post some resources in the chat, that would be fantastic. And thank you very much. OK, colleagues. Um, very good. I don't see any further hands up or um, points in the chat. I uh, saw that Marie Joseph uh, very helpfully proposed that we can reach out to the committee if we would like to share some concerns or patterns that we identify on the ground. And oftentimes, um, uh, I believe uh, it can start from very simple. Uh, um, initiatives such as a confidential briefing, such as uh, uh, sharing information we collect in the field on the ground in our operations. Um, and uh, this already contributes to uh, highlighting the issues and uh, the worrying concerns uh, that we witness on the ground without necessarily going into specific cases if it's not possible in, in the context. Um, I think this brings us then uh, to the end of our event, uh, dear colleagues. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, uh, we hope that uh, this is not really the last uh, um, time that we gather and discuss. Uh, we wanted to start tackling the topic. So, of course, there are now many fora uh, that focus on uh, racism, but this niche of racism in the context of humanitarian actions, in the context of internal displacement, is not uh, that often um, brought up. And we feel that uh, this is a gap and we will try to respond to it. And based on the needs you have, also I'm turning to Youssef and uh, colleagues who are on the ground to hear from you what would be useful for you, uh, what you would like to receive from us or just discuss further or brainstorm together. Um, as a heads up, we, will, we are now working with Lobna, who is on the call, of course, on uh, developing a module for field protection clusters on how to uh, tackle uh, racism and related intolerance in the context of internal displacement. Thank you, Lobna. Uh, so uh, this is to be finalized in December. Uh, Lobna, would you like to say a few words? Happily, um, I think it's very I want to say exciting, but it's very sad actually that we have to tackle this topic. Um, it is high time that we look into it more deeply. It was surprising to find out that it is a topic that is not usually on our radar when we talk about IDP protection. So in that sense, I'm really happy that it's coming to surface and we're catching up. Um, I am working on a session, on a training session that we will pilot um, to a group of participants, I think Yusuf is with us here online as well, um, and taking their opinions. And then once it's finalized, we will be sharing it together with the whole package with everyone in the in the field for you guys to own it basically and use it as you deem appropriate. So if anyone has any suggestions or highlights or key messages or topics that you really want to see in there, please reach out and let me know. I'd be currently we're in the design phase, so I'll be happy to take in uh, all suggestions and requests. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Lobna. 
and we really uh, look forward to having this module ready for our field colleagues, but everybody on the call more than happy to get your perspectives, suggestions, examples and incorporate them in the materials. I see Rosanna in the meantime is sharing a lot of uh, useful resources in the chat. So um, thank you for that. We will make sure also it's included in the summary of this event so that we record them and put them together um, uh, in, uh, in this session background note. Very good colleagues, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you for uh, the space we have um, given to this very important topic and we look forward to being in touch. Uh, um, feel free to reach out directly. Um, thanks to Claude, thank, uh, thanks to Marie Joseph and of course to Bruno uh, for sharing your experiences and uh, expertise with us and we will be definitely in touch. Thank you for having us, Valerie. Thank you, colleagues. Very interesting. Thank you.